Hello families, my name is Ashley Dar, and I am Grand Oaks Talent Development Teacher. This is my 17th year as a TD teacher. I started out at JV Washam and then came over here to Grand Oak. Uh, I went to college in Virginia at William & Mary and I have my master's in gifted education from UConn. I had the chance to serve on our district's gifted plan advisory team and it was a great opportunity to advocate for our kids at the district level. Um, and I've also been an instructor for CMS's gift ed program which is designed to uh, teach classroom teachers about the needs of gifted kids. Uh, at Grand Oak, we use the terms TD or talent development and AIG or academically intellectually gifted and gifted education interchangeably. So TD is CMS's version of gifted education and AIG is the state's version of gifted identification. Um, at Grand Oak, we don't distinguish between kids based on their gifted identification. Um, I get to work with kids who are identified gifted and kids who are not identified gifted. Um, but in both cases, we are looking at the kids' class performance. And so depending on how kids are performing on the certain skill that the teachers are teaching at that time, um, I do see some kids uh, for their gifted education services. And at sometimes I'll see different groups of kids. So when do I get to see them? Well, um, this year, instead of pushing into the classrooms, so like last year, if I had your child in third grade, I would co-teach with their classroom teachers twice a week. Um, in fourth grade, it's different. And so I actually pull the kids um, to my room for their gifted services. Um, this is because the kids are in different classes. And so in order to serve them, uh, they all come together. So for reading, I get to work with the kids in block one on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and I get to work with the kids in block two reading on Mondays and Thursdays. Um, for math, uh, both blocks one and two, I get to see on Wednesdays and Fridays. Um, I'll send you a message every other week to let you know about our activities and the groups are designed to be flexible. And so if your child is needing more support or practice with a specific standard or skill, uh, he or she might stay with their classroom teacher rather than coming for enrichment or acceleration with us. Um, alternatively, sometimes if a child who usually stays with the classroom teacher uh, is ready for more of a challenge, then that child might join our group. Um, because the kids are missing their regular class time with their classroom teachers to come to receive their enrichment services, um, it's important that they understand what's going on um, in the classroom when they come to see me. So uh, for both math and reading, uh, when I pull the kids, uh, the remainder kids in the classroom are either working independently on their pathways or they're working with the teacher in a small group. So for math, they're working with Mrs. Kershaw or Mrs. Kavanaugh. So when I pull the kids, they're not missing whole group instruction or um, everybody playing a game. Um, the kids are working in small groups with the teachers or independently on their pathways. Do they have to finish the pathway work that they miss when they come to get their uh, enrichment or acceleration? No. So the kids will have a weekly work checklist this year and there is a pathway task box where they write down what they did that day. And so instead of writing down a specific activity, they can write Mrs. Dar because we're gonna do that work in place of the work from the regular classroom. Um, this is the slide that I share with the kids I see for reading. Um, so it's very much the same. Um, the kids who are staying with their classroom teachers when I pull groups of kids will either be working independently on their pathway choice board, uh, or they'll be working in a small group with Mrs. McDonald or Ms. Carr, depending on who they have for reading. Um, do they have to finish that choice board because they missed work when they were gone? No. So uh, they have to do row one on their choice board, but row two is optional. And so our work, the work that the kids do when they come to me is designed to be in place of row two. Um, if you have any questions about this, uh, you can certainly ask classroom teachers or reach out to me and I'd be happy to get clarification. Okay, so what are we doing in reading? Well, we're gonna be working on responding to reading. 
um, using thinking maps, which I'm going to show you more about in a moment, uh, and using text evidence to support our ideas. We're going to make content connections. Uh, so the first quarter, the kids are studying poetry. And so we're going to look at the impact of syllable patterns uh, on the mood of the poem. I think the kids are going to enjoy looking at poetry in an analytical way. Um, the second quarter, kids study animal defense mechanisms, and so we're going to study human defense mechanisms. Uh, I mentioned that we're going to use thinking maps. Thinking maps are consistent visual patterns that are connected to specific thought processes. And by using thinking maps, the kids are able to take their abstract thoughts and make concrete images. Um, the more fluent the kids are with the maps, uh, the better that they'll understand text structure, the better they'll understand the way questions are asked, uh, and then they'll be able to apply it to their writing as well. So if I had your child last year in third grade, uh, we worked with thinking maps and we're gonna continue to build on that foundation this year. Here's an example of uh, looking at some poetry and looking at the syllable patterns and determining um, how it impacts the mood of the poem. Um, and here are a few human defense mechanisms that we're going to look at uh, as the, the kids are studying animal defense mechanisms in class. And then our big overall question is gonna be what's similar about these types of defense mechanisms. Okay, in math, uh, we will often start our classes with finger facts. Finger facts are uh, questions that have answers uh, from zero to 10. And so when the kids figure out the answer, they hold up their fingers to show the answer. Um, they don't have to write anything down to solve it. They're welcome to, but they don't have to. Uh, and that's pretty appealing for a lot of the kids to not have to write it down. Uh, we are starting their million dollar project. And so to practice some place value and addition and subtraction, um, we are, every kid has won a million dollars and they have to spend as much of it as possible. And so they're gonna buy a house, they're gonna buy a car, um, they're gonna save for college, they're gonna make charitable contributions. Um, and so practicing uh, mostly the subtraction skills with larger numbers. Um, three ways to think about subtraction. So if you're subtracting 100 minus 87, um, I learned the way in the middle, which was the algorithm. So, you know, you can't take seven from zero, so you go next door. Oh, that's still a zero, so you have to go over again, cross out the one, write a little zero. Then you come back and you break the 100 into 10 tens and then cross that out. Uh, so that's certainly valid. It obviously still works, so <laughs> that's one way to solve it. Um, if you look at the first column, though, counting up, if you're subtracting 100 minus 87, um, you can add 3 to 87 to get to 90, and then you just add on your 10 to get to 100. And so kids who are solving it in their head often solve it that way. Um, the last column there, um, we are subtracting one from each number. Because we're subtracting one from each number, we're keeping the difference between the numbers the same. But instead of having to try to take seven from zero, uh, when we make 100 into 99, it becomes a much easier looking problem uh, to subtract 86 from 99. So these are just three strategies that the kids can use, uh, and we're gonna practice using different strategies to solve. Okay, I wanted to show you more about multiplication and division. Um, I thought this was pretty great. Seven out of five parents can't help their kids with their elementary school math homework. So the way I learned how to divide, um, if I was going to do 148 divided by four, um, first you start with the one and say, well, four can't go into one. So you say, well, how many fours are in 14? Three. So I write the three at the top and then I do three times four is 12. 14 minus 12 is two. Then I say, how many fours are in 28? Because I bring down my eight. Oh, seven. So I put my seven at the top. 7 times 4, 28. 28 minus 28 is 0. Oh, thank goodness I don't have a remainder, right? And so 148 divided by 4 is 37. This way certainly still works. It's great. Another way to think about this is with partial quotients. And so we're thinking about uh, the number and we're thinking about place value. So instead of saying 4 doesn't go into 1, we can say how many 4s are in 100? 25. 
how many fours are in 40? Another 10. And then how many fours are in eight? Another two. And when you add our partial quotients together, you get the answer as the quotient. So it's just another way to think about these numbers and uh, help to make sense of it in your head. Same thing with multiplication. Um, if you're multiplying 538 times 7, you get an answer of 3,766. Um, I was taught the way that um, you can see on the right there, you know, 8 times 7 is 56. So you put down the 6 and you write a little 5 uh, on top of the 3. 7 times 3 is 21. Add 5, 26. Put down the 6, put a little 2 above the 5. 7 times 5, 35, plus 2, 37. Certainly, that way it works. Uh, partial products. Uh, is one strategy that the kids are going to use. And you're just looking at the values of the numbers. So rather than when you do eight times seven, rather than putting the little five above the three, you put the five as it's a 50 um, in the tens column in the answer. And so it's reinforcing those place value concepts. Um, it helps kids to be able to um, not make as many silly mistakes. Right. So if you accidentally write the little five in the wrong column, then that's going to get you the wrong answer. So if instead you break it down by place value, um, you can make more sense of it. So this is just another way that we uh, multiply. There's another way we multiply. We can use the area model. So for area model, um, you make kind of a, a table or a grid and you take uh, one of the factors and you break it out by place value. Um, this one is is. You know, we have a three digit multiplying by a one digit number. You can actually break both numbers out by place value. And then you're showing how you get um, each partial product um, and then adding it together to get your full product. Partial quotients. Uh, so this is similar to what we looked at before, but this problem is a little bit more complex. So if you're dividing 3,766 by seven, I can break it into numbers that I know are evenly divisible by seven. So I might start with 3,500. And so if I pull 3,500 from 3,766, I'm not all the way there. So now I need to pull another multiple of seven. Uh, and so I might pull 210 and then I'm left with 56. And so I can look at, well, how many sevens are in each part of that quotient? Um, on the right-hand side is maybe a more traditional way to think about division combined with partial quotients. So instead of just writing, uh, for example, if you start with how many sevens are in 3,700, instead of just writing a five above the seven there, um, you actually write the number 500. And so you're just using place value uh, to more accurately show the value of the number. So again, standard algorithm absolutely works. Um, but these are just different ways to be able to play with numbers and have that number sense. Uh, one final thought, it's okay to give the kids the answer when they're learning to solve these kind of problems. So, so often our kids are focused on speeding to get the answer uh, and they equate being fast with being smart and we want them to focus on the process. And so if you give them the answer from the get-go, then they're less likely to race to the end and make mistakes. So instead, I want them to show their thinking. And so uh, sometimes giving kids the answer up front uh, allows them to slow down and show the actual thought process. So thank you so much for watching. Um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to chat with you. My email information is on the first slide. Um, it's Ashley, A-S-H-L-E-Y-H dot dar d a r r at c m s dot k twelve dot n c dot u s. Thank you so much.